I was watching Andy. Uh oh, you can hear that? Yeah. <laughs> Do you know the name of that song? The Andy the theme to the Andy Griffith Show. <laughs> sure, there's the name, a name of it is, the name of it is called Fishing Hole. That's right, it is. Hmm? That just tells you how much free time I have. <laughs> well, the other day, my last Saturday, my husband and I were sitting in the backyard reading, and he said, Do we have any plans for tomorrow? I just looked at the What? <laughs> and my neighbor was also sitting in her yard reading, and she yelled, This is what we're doing tomorrow, Mike. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> okay, Cliff, you're up and we're up on YouTube and you're recording. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to call the um, Rochester, Town of Rochester Zoning Board of Appeals uh, meeting to order. The first matter on our agenda is the continued application of uh, Ola uh, Stasek. Mr. Mrs. Stasek? Stasek, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Should we have a roll Mike, call they first? Unmuted? Yeah, they're unmuted. You, yeah, you, uh, Good you need to do the roll, uh, the roll call first of the attendance. OK, good idea. Okay. Um, all right. Um, Bruce? Present. Uh, Charlie? Present. Uh, Bill? Present. OK, and uh, Cliff Mallory. Um, Bill, you're still an alternate? Yeah, still an alternate. Okay, because of a vacancy on the board, um, Mr. Barringer will sit as a member this evening and um, continue to hear the matters before us. Okay. Okay, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Stasek. Yes. We're here. Um, so we have a continued application. Um, it's the matter of your deck and um, as I understand it, uh, you have modified your plans um, so that you no longer have um, a uh, request for a setback variance. That's correct. Okay, but yes. now the, the, the issue seems to be that um, under the fire code, um, your deck, because it's not attached, would have to be 12 feet from the house. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So what we're attempt, uh, doing now is, is a variance to allow the deck to be in closer proximity to the house. Uh, doesn't make sense to have it 12 feet away from the, from the door. Right, so I was, I was um, unclear as to um, your, your application and, and the issue here. So I spoke to, um, um, Mr. Davis, the code enforcement officer, and uh, explained it to me. Um, your deck has faces onto a door of the house, right? That's correct. And I asked him if there was some kind of ramp, and in this case, it looks like it would be a very short ramp that attached the deck to the house. Would you still need a variance? Did you speak to him about that? Uh, no, uh, because uh, it would it would according to how I understood what he was telling me, it would have to be a twelve foot ramp uh, to get to the, the the setback from the house to the deck. Apparently, if it's closer than that, it's considered part of the structure. Well, my question to Mr. Davis was was this: um, I don't have a deck on my house, but I had another house that did have a deck and the, and the deck abutted the house. And so I asked if, if your deck abutted the house, would that be an issue? My understanding is it, that it wouldn't. And if I can just hop in here for a second, uh, Mr. Chairman, I also was a little bit confused about what was going on. So now that's clarified. If it's a state fire code issue, I don't believe that we can issue a, a variance to a state code. We can issue variances to the town code. Well, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. All I, all I know is that 
in order to for him to approve the building of the deck, it, even though it's freestanding, and even though it's under 150 square feet, it needs to be away from the house by 12 feet. Uh, and that's that's where we left it. And, and I said, well, maybe I can get a variance to that effect that we just have it still freestanding, but close enough that you can step out onto it. Okay, I'm, well, I'm pulling up our code to see if it's a, a setback that we have for between structures. Mary, yeah. is, is that what it is, Mike? We, and I don't know the numbers, but we do have a, when it's freestanding structures, there is a distance between them that must occur. It's okay, so it, you may have missed, feet. thank you. Yep. So it may have been that you misspoke or I misheard that it was fire code, but it is town code. Okay, well, that's what uh, Jerry explained to me that it was fire code. Um, he said, for instance, if you build a garage, a freestanding garage, because of the fire code, it has to be 12, if it's not right. attached to the house, it has to be 12 feet away, or mm -hmm. and there has to be a breezeway or something between the house and the freestanding garage. Same thing with the deck. If it's freestanding, for the same reason, he said, it would have to be 12 feet away. I asked him, though, if there was, for instance, um, a bridge or something that attached the structure to the house, would that still be a problem? Because I, many houses have decks that are attached, right? Yes. It's fairly common. And he, I thought he's, he was indicating to me that if it was attached to the house, there wasn't a problem. But if the deck is attached to the house, then it falls under the setback that we originally ran into. That was the 40. I so see. Okay. So like got... 22 for us because we can't find a way of, of even though we've modified everything, uh, that it should work. It, it, it just doesn't seem to, uh, to work in this case, no matter what we do. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I also submitted that sheet that uh, deals with the, uh, the zoning law and, and the Board of Appeals and, you know, kind of answered the questions that were put forward in that mm -hmm. regarding, you know, what, what are we trying to achieve here? And in each case, what we're guarding against by having the zoning we're not conflicting with it. We're not, we're not damaging the neighborhood. We're not in, inflicting any damage anywhere. So, you know, our contention is one way or the other, <laughs> we should be able to get a variance. And I don't know, you know, how that variance needs to be written, but there's nothing in the code that tells me that, you know, we're stepping on anybody's toes. Mary Lou, it is 140-13D. Yeah, I'm looking at it. Yeah, I'm and I think it. the reason fire code was mentioned is that code is put in town code to deal with fire issues. Yeah, I know. Uh, it's not fire code as in New York State fire code. So okay. All right. I think it's a terminology mistake. Okay. Spoken. All right. Okay. Now, we're happy to attach it to the house. <laughs> That's not, we were trying to, to get around the other easement um, by not attaching it. Um, because, well, that was the direction we were given if it's not attached. Uh, so the code also says a minimum of 12 feet or one half the average height right. of the two structures. So the average height is considered along with the railing, right? So that's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 42 inches tall. What's the height of the house? That's a good question. It's a good question. It's two story. It, well, no, it's three stories. Oh, so we yeah. got the attic. But we okay. have an attic, yeah. So, so roughly 24 cool. feet, right? Yeah. So you're still, be... right. So it'd be what, eight, 16? About uh, 20. Twenty. About 24. Yeah, 24 is about roughly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's my guess. I'm trying to look up a, a one of the forms. So if we go with four feet and 24 feet, right? The average height is what? 12. Yeah, we're still in the same spot, right? Somewhere around there? No. 
I don't do math in public well. <laughs> okay. Bruce, any other comments or questions? No. No, that, that sort of makes it worse than the 12 feet. The 12 feet is... Yeah. Okay. Charlie, do you have comments, questions? No, I don't. Bill? No. Nope. Okay. All right, well. Yeah. Is there anything more you care to add? Otherwise, we can, I guess, schedule a public hearing. Um, we no, just that you know. I also submitted an aerial map that you know clearly shows the distances between the deck and our nearest neighbor would be three hundred and twenty feet, and that's down the ravine. And on the other side it'd be 420 feet to the uh, nearest building, uh, the neighbor's home, um, you know, on the, towards the north side. Um, I think that it's pretty obvious from that that it's not gonna be something that anybody's gonna uh, see either from the road or from the neighbors or, you know, it's really an invisible thing. Um, but even if it was visible, you know, that, that, that list I gave you where we, you know, answered some of the questions, you know, in terms of what this deck represents or, or you know, where the deck would be at issue uh, with the, the zoning uh, law. Uh, they're just not, it's not conflicting with them except for the numbers of the setback, you know, that, that, that's true, it conflicts with that. But with the spirit and the intent of the law, I don't, I don't see a conflict. And, and that's, that's where we'll leave it uh, for today. When, when, uh, if you could enlighten me in terms of what the next step is, and if it goes to a hearing or, or how, how does, what happens next? What, what are we looking at next? Well, the next step would be to schedule a public hearing to get public comments. Um, and then um, we would conclude your application and make a decision. Okay. Okay. All right. Can that's I fine. Make a suggestion, um, Chairman Mallory. Yes. Um, when you send it for public hearing, you may also want to send it to the fire department or district to see if they have any concerns, seeing as it appears that's the reason that 12 foot gap is supposed to be there. They may not have any concerns with no neighbors being close by, but I think it might be good to get their input. I think I think that's a great idea because in my mind, we really, we have the um, application that's been filed, which is for um, an area variance, uh, setback variance, which seems to evolved into a um, fire type um, code variance or a building code based upon fire issue um, variants. And I'm not sure which we'd rather deal with. Um, so it, it would be useful, I think, um, Brianna, if we could uh, contact the fire department and ask them to comment on this particular situation. Okay. And please make it clear to them that this is not a structure, that this is a deck. <laughs> yeah, they'll get a copy of, the, of what you've Very submitted. Good. Right, okay. yeah. They'll need to, to look at exactly what it is that you'd like to um, to construct. Right. Very good. Um, thank you. Well, at this point, is there a motion to um, schedule a public hearing? I'll make that motion. For June. All right. I'll uh, second. I, all right, I just, second it. I'm sorry, Bruce. But before we have the motion, I just want to cover one other item. And that's sure. in section 65-4 under building permits. It says construction or installation of one story detached structures associated with a one or two family dwellings or multiple single dwelling townhouses, which are used for tool and storage shed playhouses or similar uses 
provided the gross floor area does not exceed 144 square feet. So if they were to shrink it three square feet to be 144 square feet or under, would they even require a building permit in this situation? It's not even a one story though. Well, the, the, the 150 square foot was not the issue. It was the fact that it was in close proximity to the home. No, but because you're over 144, I would ask Mr. Davis if you were at 144 square feet or less, if you still have the same issue. Uh-huh. Okay, Casey, I can ask that question. You, yeah, you might want to reference that particular um, section of the code that um, Mr. Saris has um, just, um Cited. So what is that? 65-4, paragraph one. Of the building, building code? Permits. Of the building permits. Okay. okay. Okay, very good. All right, anything and else? And that's stating no, that, that was, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just felt that that's me. Good. Okay, we have okay. a motion to schedule a, a public hearing for the next meeting in June. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Charlie? Charlie? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Bill? Aye. Aye. Okay, motion carries. So, Mr. and Mrs. Stasek, what we'll have is a, uh, we'll schedule a public hearing for next month. Um, and at that point, um, we will uh, conclude your application and consider um, a decision. Great, great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. And uh, stay safe, everybody. Thanks, you too. You, too. you as well. Thank you. Okay, the next application is the continued application public hearing of Borrego Solar. Uh, Mr. Smith. Hi, good evening. Hi. And I've also unmuted Adam Paddock, the applicant, Cliff. Okay. Good evening, guys. Good evening, Adam. Hi. All right. So at the last meeting, we opened the public hearing. Are there any comments or questions or public commentators? Mike, do we know of anybody who's from the um, public calling in on this? Let me just uh, run through the two phone calls and see if either of them are. Uh, the person that with the phone ending in 5180, uh, which application are you here for? Uh, Hoot. Okay, thank you. And the person with the phone number ending in 0647, which application are you here for? Zero six four seven phone number. It's the Hoots application. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, it appears not to be none, Cliff. Okay, and there's a gentleman um, under the heading spare. Oh yes. That's. You're muted. I'm trying to unmute. So yeah. It is not allowing me to unmute that person. There. There we go. Oh, it was. Now it's muted again. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, the person labeled spare. Which application? Ben Gailey, I'm the attorney for Hoots. Oh, okay. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> I'm going to mute you for the moment. That's okay. So there are no public comments, no one from the public wishing to comment on the um, Borrego solar application? We did get one um, written comment, correct, Brianna? Yes. So I just want to make sure you make that part of the record. Right. So you're... Uh, 
with respect to a um, a memo submitted by uh, Mr. Fornell. Is that it? Yes. Okay. Has everyone seen that? Bruce, have you seen that? Uh, I read it briefly, but we should read it into the record, I guess. Yeah, very briefly. Uh, Charlie, have you seen it? Yes, I did. Bill? Yes, I've seen it very briefly. Well, it's very brief. Okay. So <laughs> yeah. we, all, we all have a copy of it? All right. So it's in the record. Okay. And I encourage you all to read it. Okay. Um, is there a motion to close the public hearing? Motion to close the public hearing on the paddock application. I'll second it. Paddock application. Um, Bruce, how do you vote? Aye. Uh, Charlie? Aye. Bill? Aye. Aye. I vote aye. So the motion carries. The public hearing is closed. Um, Mr. Smith, is there anything in addition you care to present? Uh no ad additional information, just uh, I don't want to rehash everything we've talked about the last couple of meetings, but just uh, sort of restate that, um, you know, we feel that this, this variance would have no negative externalities to the neighbors, uh, the neighborhood of others, um, and would really only, you know, benefit um, the, the, the paddocks, the solar facility owner, and any future owners of these parcels. Um, and I think last time we, we did just talk about how that there is precedent to this. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if the board was able to look into that, but um, we'd appreciate. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, sorry, Adam, were you gonna cut in there? Nope, not at all. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so we do appreciate your consideration on this. All right, then um, we will put this on our agenda for the next month's meeting for a consideration and determination. Okay, thank you. Um, and we will, I assume that's going to be, or tentatively still online and um, that'll be something we can attend or I can attend as well. Um, I don't know how the, the meeting will um, be scheduled but if it's online, yes, it'll be available to the public. Okay, great. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the next application um, is the continued application and continued public hearing of Sean and Allison Hoots. Okay, um, so we had, um, we open the public hearing at our last meeting. That public hearing continues at this meeting. Uh, are there members of the public who wish to be heard? Uh, um, we do uh, have um, some Mary Lou, applicants should, attorney that you might want to right, recognize who, first. Who they I, want to present anything. Uh, I would unmute Ben to start, okay. Ben Daly. <laughs> All right, Mr. Gailey, do you, um, would you care to speak? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, you know, we had a fairly lengthy hearing in April um, and you know, there were comments made by uh, some of the neighbors of the Hoots and their attorney. And none of those comments presented any type of evidence to the board um, of a detriment to the neighborhood and which is really the, the primary factor for the board to consider. As you know, there's you know, five statutory factors, uh, but the bottom line is a weighing of the benefit to the applicant versus any detriment to the neighborhood or the environment. And we didn't hear any of that. Uh, we heard concerns expressed about noise, uh, but those were just generalized objections and speculative concerns about what the future may hold um, I submitted a, um, a brief memo to the board a couple of days ago 
uh, which set forth the, the case law requirements. And you know, the cases are very clear that generalized objections and speculation um, don't provide evidence and the board must base its decisions on evidence. And with respect to the noise then in particular, uh, we submitted a supplemental report from our noise expert, um, which states that when the music studio is being used in normal operations, um, there will be uh, no sound in all caps in his report at the property line. And when a board, any board receives an expert report um, and it's not countered by any evidence um, by others, the board is, is bound to, you know, to give merit to that report and that report defeats the generalized concerns by the neighbors. Um, the, the only, you know, one could argue that the requested variance is substantial, uh, but none of the statutory factors uh, controls and the board must consider all those factors in making its determination in, in, the, in the balancing test. And we'll note with respect to the substantial issue um, that the, you know, the additional size of the, of the studio above the 500 uh, square feet, you know, that, that increase in size doesn't cause any increase in, in detriment to the neighborhood. And as we said, there really is none and there's been no evidence presented um, of any detriment. And um, we, there's a case um, in one of Allison's letters called a Klingemit where a home occupation um, was approved with a variance that was 250% greater than the, than the requirement. I think in our case, we're around 150% above the, uh, the 500 square foot requirement. That's all I have to say for now. Uh, the board must base its decision on the evidence and there's all the evidence here points in favor of granting the variance. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Is there another speaker? Uh, yep, yeah, I will uh, unmute here. Uh, the person 5180, uh, you are unmuted. Um, I, I'm, I don't have anything more to add from what I um, spoke about last time. It's just the same. I also included a letter. So nothing's changed in a month. Okay, um, because of the, the way this heating, this hearing is being conducted and, and um, uh, obviously not face to face, but if you could identify yourself. Okay, I'm, I live next door, 86 Catalpa Lane. I'm also the president of the Lane Association. So um, Mr. Marcus? I hear, yes, that's correct. Hi, Jesse Marcus. And then, so um, I guess the only thing that I would say, because I'm also on the other line trying to help um, the Mary Jean and Steve kind of log into the call because um, I think Mary Jean wanted to speak as well, but they're having a hard time with the technology. But um, the, I, I, as the as the Lane president, I have just over the past couple of years just heard the complaints from everyone. It they kind of funnels to me, so. Um, just overall, it's just been difficult with the with the construction and the um, and the current status of the traffic, and so that's just overall the concern for the the lane and the neighbors that surround her, including not only on Catalpa um, but behind them on Hemlock, uh, that are affected by a potential commercial business of of this stature. Is just you know overall just a lot of concern for for the the peace and quiet of the neighborhood and traffic to Catalpa Lane. Um, so we just you know based on R two zoning we just bought we purchased in this area for that um, type of I guess uh, relationship and so that's you know that's kind of. Um, you know, just the similar, sorry, I'm not on, um, I, I wasn't, I, I, I spoke last time. I wrote a letter. I'm a little, little, um, discombobulated tonight. I had a death in the family yesterday. 
and so um, just a little, little um, not as focused. I wasn't planning on speaking first either, but ultimately it's just, um, you know, a lot of overall concern from the neighbors. That's kind of why we're, you know, how we got to where we are today. If that, that makes sense. Thank you, Mr. Marcus, and I'm sorry for your loss. Um, if you need time to um, organize your thoughts, perhaps you could speak later in the um, in the okay. meeting. Okay, oh, no, I, I I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Anything further? Uh, nothing at further at the moment. Thank you. Okay, Cliff. I'm going to go to uh, Emily Stenson, the uh, attorney. Thank you, Mr. Marcus. Okay, Ms. Benson. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so the primary reason, as you know, that we believe that an area variance should not be granted is because this is not a um, class two home occupation at all. So would you like me to speak to that now or hold it for the other public hearing? That's up to you. I'm happy to just kind of combine everything as far as I'm, I'm concerned. Well, if you want it on the record for the other one, you're going to have to say it again at the other one. All right. Well, I don't want so to wait. We have any, that. you know, so you might want to stick to. Okay. That's fine. To whatever okay. we're application we're talking about. Because. Fair enough. Perfect. <laughs> so uh, I did submit a, a letter today just to really try to focus on the, the key points. It's a short letter, I promise. Um, but as far as the area variance, um, you know, our main, our, our main objection is that this is not a class two home occupation at all, as we'll discuss um, in the next public hearing. Um, we did submit a, a lengthy letter April 16th going through each of the criteria for an area variance and explaining um, why this project does not meet any of those criteria. Um, it is very substantial, and the size of the uh, the size of the variance does affect the impacts on the neighborhood. In that, a studio of this size will accommodate larger performing groups, which means more traffic, more noise. So it's very much uh, an, a, a, a criteria there. Um, as far as undesirable change in the neighborhood. Um, we, we discussed traffic impacts. The, the intended use here is to have outside bands come and record in the studio. That means people who don't live there will be coming in and out of the neighborhood. That's a change to the neighborhood. Um, as far as the noise impacts, the uh, evidence that we were relying on is the evidence the applicants provided, which is their noise study that they produced last fall, which measured noise at 47 dBA. Um, if there's a supplementary noise study, we would like to see that. We, uh, we have not seen that. Um, if there is, we would like a chance to review that and respond to it. Um, the Going through the criteria, the benefit could have been achieved by other methods besides building an oversized studio in this location. Um, as I said, the area variance is substantial. It's 56% larger than allowed. Um, it will have adverse effects uh, through traffic, through noise, um, through uh, visual impacts. Uh, today, my client sent a, a photograph of a, a professional sign that's been installed that does not look like something that would be in a neighborhood. Um, and the, the final criteria, whether this was self-created, it was entirely self-created. So those are the criteria that the board needs to weigh. Um, and, you know, again, we don't even think this variant should be under consideration because this is not a class two home occupation. But if you do decide that it is, then we think that you should deny the variance for all of those reasons. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. May I respond to that? You, uh... You have one more person to speak here, Cliff. Um, well, we have, I think Mr. Gailey wants to uh, comment. Or I can wait until the other person speaks. Yeah, but you still have a person from the public who wants to speak. Okay. Oh, okay. So the person on 0647. Um, you are unmuted, 0647. 
Um, yes, thank you. This is uh, Ravika Rajkishan and David Osterweil. We're represented by Emily Svensson, as you know, um, and spoke at the last hearing. Um, and we really want to reiterate tonight that it is not just one or two people or five people who have spoken out against um, what the hoots are trying to do on our lane and in the surrounding areas. You've heard from directly affected people um, versus the, the letters that they submitted where there were people who were self-interested in recording music and conducting business on the lane. And I really think that you all need to take that into consideration also. Who are the directly affected people? The Hootsa's lawyer keeps saying, like, our evidence is unsubstantiated. Well, a lot of us have spoken up. And just to give you a sense of, like, what kind of organizing this has taken to get everybody to speak up, like, we've had to organize ourselves, collect testimonials, submit them, pay for Emily collectively. Like, this hasn't just been, like, the effort of one of two people. This has been the effort of all of the people that you've heard from who are directly affected by what the hoots are trying to do. Our property values um, are of concerns to us, the increased traffic, the increased noise. Um, it has been absolutely horrible to have the hoots as, as neighbors. Like from the moment they moved in, like they've caused a situation here that has really changed the lifestyle of so many people who have moved here for a certain reason, who've invested their entire living savings to do this. And then just to speak to like what it's been like in the last couple of months during the pandemic, it's amazing to see folks like wonder a stay at home order under a cessation of like unnecessary construction to just see construction trucks going back and forth with materials. I mean, we could submit more photos actually of more trucks coming in with materials. And we're actually very confused about how they're even allowed to do this or how they're even doing this during a pandemic situation. And so this is how they act during a pandemic situation. Imagine how they're going to act when there isn't a pandemic going on. And so there's, we absolutely do not trust them. We do not trust that they are going to stick by any kind of, um, any kind of order. And we really hope that you all will take into account everything that's been said so far. Um, it's been it's been really, really difficult to have them and to have them change our lifestyle on this road. Um, and I think that's significant. Like the reason the whole reason for public hearing is to hear about how people directly affected how their lives have been changed because of the situation. And to me, that is not insignificant. Like the Hootsman lawyer keeps, you know, trying to say that that is insignificant. It is not insignificant. We have to live our lives here. And we have to live with this ongoing situation, and that's not insignificant. And frankly, I'd ask the CBA and the board members, like, whether you would be okay living under those circumstances, knowing that you've invested your life savings into a home that you love. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Can I add one thing I forgot to say? Who would you like me to go to next, Cliff? Uh, I don't know. I think there's someone waiting for admission. Yes, there is. Thank you. Uh, the person ending in 3512. Hi, yes, this is Steve Tiffany. OK, yeah, you're, you're, you were recognized for the public hearing. <laughs> I'm a neighbor at the end of the road, and uh, uh, I don't know. I think there's someone waiting for admission. <laughs> there is. Thank you. Hello, am I on now? Or yeah, if you're watching the video, you need to turn that off while you're speaking because otherwise, you're going to get a time delay. Okay. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're. 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 Okay. Now. Now is it okay? Yes, I believe it is. Thank you. I'm at the end of the road, and uh, it is a dead end road, private road. And that's why most people live here, because it's a private road. And uh, I know that in the notices I've gotten, 
that it states that it's a private commercial studio is what they want to establish. And that's kind of an oxymoron to me because the way that it's going to be private and commercial at the same time. It's a, pr it's a private road. It's a dead end road. And I don't want a commercial business running past my house every day. And that's my biggest concern. Not so much sound or anything. It's the uh, it's the traffic. And I don't think any of you would want a commercial business running on your road with traffic going by it constantly. We, we all live here because this is a private dead end road. And now it's become less than a private road. So uh, and there and the hootses are at the end of the road. So everything goes by everyone's houses, and uh, I don't think anybody's happy about it. And and I think that it's really a travesty that the town doesn't uphold the zoning law. It's a residential area, and it absolutely should stay residential. End of the story. I don't know why there should be even a even a hearing. So I, I think that's you know all I have to say, and and the lawyer for the Hootses thinks that it it's nothing that it, nobody's been disturbed. Well, everyone's been disturbed. So I guess that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tiffany. The procedure we followed uh, has been um, that when someone wants to speak, they they raise their hand electronically, and Mr. Baden will. Um, will recognize you. Um, is, does anyone have, is there a hand raised, Mike? Is there anything further? There, there are no hands raised. Um, the three people who've called in, I have them back muted. Uh, both Ms. Fenson and, and Mr. Gailey are unmuted. So I'll leave it to you as to, to call on either of them if you'd like. Well, what I'd like is for them both to be muted and okay. unmuted when um, they wish to speak. Okay. I'd like to avoid are, back and forth if I could. Yep, they are all muted. All right, so would either of you care to speak? All right, Ms. Fenson indicating no, Mr. Gailey indicating yes. Yep, he is unmuted. Okay, thank you. Um, well, first I just want to say that the, the prior speaker who was making the mean comments about the who's is, that's just offensive. And the the comments about how things have been bad on the road and the traffic, that was when the construction was taking place. And, you know, construction is never pleasant for, for anybody. The construction is over now. It's been over. So you can't forecast that there will be construction vehicles in the future when the construction is already completed. Uh, the Hoots have made it very clear in their statements that they've made to the board and also in the letters they've submitted that the traffic will be minimal. The home occupation allows uh, limited visitors, occasion, limited and occasional visitors, I believe is the wording. Um, it anticipates that there will be visitors similar to a residential use, and the Hoots have said that that's what it will be. Um, you can't project into the future and say, oh, they're going to violate the criteria in the, in the zoning law. Um, if that were to happen, and I'm certain it will not, because contrary to the statements you heard, the Hoots have been have complied with the law completely throughout this process. Um, they've never had any issues with the town at all. The issues have only been with a few of the neighbors. And I should point out there that um, only three households are um, represented by their attorney in, in opposing this matter. And uh, multiple letters and support have been submitted by other members of the public, including immediate neighbors and including longtime residents of the town. Uh, with respect to the traffic, you know, it's not going to be like some, I, I don't know what people fear or expect here. Um, the, the fear of the unknown, I suppose, but it's not going to be commercial traffic driving up and down the road constantly. It's going to be very limited. They've made that very clear in their submissions to the board. Um, again, with respect to the noise, you know, we have an expert report that says there'll be no noise at the property, none. Um, 
And in terms of whether the benefits are otherwise available, they, they simply aren't. Um, the Hoots explained very clearly in their letters and at the last hearing, you know, why they had to uh, build a studio, a music studio that exceeds the 500 square foot requirement, um, simply in order to fit the, the necessary equipment. Um, the a home occupation or class two home occupation is a principal permitted use in the R2 zoning district. It's a permitted use. So the zoning code anticipates and allows, um, you know, this type of commercial activity provided that you meet the criteria of the class two home occupation. Um, it also allows a sign. There was a, uh, a protest about the sign that was installed. Uh, signs are permitted of a certain size and that's, that's, that's what was uh, uh, installed on the property. If you just give me one second, please. Can you tell me when those other people need anything done to their house? On that roof. Uh, the, the comment was made that there was unsubstantiated evidence. In fact, in fact, there's been no evidence at all that has been submitted, um, you know, to show that the area variance uh, should be denied. I think Allison wants. Allison may want to make a comment. Yes. Sorry, my my daughter keeps waking up right now. But um, what we. What we want to just point out is um, our home was owned by only summer folk for decades. And we moved in, we found a mess, we had construction, then we built a building. We realized that was noisy. We realized this upset neighbors. We have been responsive to every complaint that neighbors have made. Every complaint, like a car sped, we would call and figure out who that was. We would immediately tell that person that they needed to abide by the speed limit. We paid out of pocket for speed limit signs on the road to make it more visible. We paid an extra $1,000 after our construction to try and be good neighbors. I, you know, we've done everything we can and we cannot appease these neighbors because they don't want to see any cars on a shared road. Private road does not need private control. They cannot control this road. You know, it, we're sorry they didn't expect it, that we could have four children and give them all cars and they'd have to deal with that. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's not what we're saying here. We're saying it is a limited and minimal amount of traffic. Um, I wouldn't even use the word traffic. Um, if we were to drive to work every day, there would be twice as much traffic than us working from home, at least. Um, and our neighbors talked about their collective collaboration um, and that there are all these people who are concerned. And the reason why all these neighbors who we've never met are concerned is because these three neighbors closest to us have gone on a mission to spread rumors about us and what we're going to do in this building. Um, saying things like there are going to be people taking drugs and people meandering the neighborhood and it's defamatory and it's offensive and it's upsetting and it's hard to be a new neighbor who doesn't know other neighbors and can't call everyone <laughs> and say our piece. Uh, it's really frustrating. Um, and honestly, I'm done with it. Um, I'm not going to sit here and say that that's okay. You cannot bully a new neighbor because you don't want them to do what is legally permitted on their property. Um, so that's really frustrating. Um, another thing I just wanted to reiterate is that um, we had neighbors from Hemlock Road, the neighbor who is directly across from the music studio, uh, write in and say he's, they're both very supportive of what we're doing. Um, we had another neighbor on Hemlock who's been here for years, who's a realtor, who said there would be no impact on home values. Um, I think that that's important to note. Um, and uh, also just to say that a 500 square foot music studio would be operated in the same manner as our 750 square foot studio. It's simply room to put equipment and room for acoustics. Um, yeah, I'd like to add that Ms. Vincent's assertion that the larger room was intended for larger ensembles, that's 100% incorrect. The size of the room is for the instruments and for the capturing of sound. I have no 
it is not part of my plan whatsoever to bring in a large number of people. I'm just simply not equipped for it uh, with the equipment that I have and it wouldn't work out anyway. That space is not for more people. It's for better sound and to store my equipment. And the, uh, just to add, the material deliveries that came recently, uh, mm -hmm. I built a ginormous garden. We've been working on a garden for two weeks. Nine, nine raised day. beds, four by eight, large posts for like, it was deliveries from Williams. That's all it was. The real detriment to our neighborhood and community right now is the way that our neighbors are behaving. They are watching us on the road. They are taking pictures of our friends coming in. They are spreading rumors about us. And that is not the way people mm -hmm. in this community should behave. And it's not what the ZBA should condone, I hope. Um, I think that's what we have to say on this issue. Um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hoots, I have a question for you. You're really chopping up there. Cliff, Cliff you may need to close out your video. Because um, music studio. Okay, how would I do that? Just just turn off your video and just leave the audio. The, I think your broadband is, your bandwidth is probably starting to, down in the bottom left corner, if you just turn off your video and just use your audio. Uh, okay. Uh, well, now it seems to be okay, but you, you were breaking up. Okay. Uh, well, my question was this, and, and actually it's more of a statement, statement to Okay, there we go, Mr. Rant, a variant. Um, that variant runs with the land. So when you say that your present intention or your intention uh, is not to um, record ensembles, um, if is it possible for you to record ensembles despite the fact that you have no intention of doing that? Well, I mean, like, uh, what I, I don't understand the definition, I guess, how specific, like, I can fit probably six people in there with their instruments, no more than that. There certainly wouldn't well, be like an orchestra. No, no, the point that is would not, not so much. My, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is not so much what you intend to do, but no, once I, we I, grant a variance, then that variance runs with the land. And the next person who comes in may well decide to record an orchestra. So right. I'm just saying, is that a possibility? Is there room for? No. Okay. No. I okay. think if you look to the photos we submitted, you know, you can see the amount of floor space available and it's, it's not that much. Yeah, and the way that the control room and the two isolation rooms basically bisect the footprint, um, the live room is not intended it is not equipped to handle that many people and then also have uh, equipment in there to record. It just wouldn't, it wouldn't work. This is by all measure, this is a personal project sized studio. Okay. But what we were able to do was fit two isolation booths, which means even quieter operation. I mean, we didn't even do the sound tests from within the ISO booth, so. Yeah. That's notable. And I mean, I know, you know, I know it's all hypothetical, idealized or whatever, but it is also my intention to be making music in this room for decades to come. Until I, we die. Yeah, we're not trying to. <laughs> we'll be here forever. I can't imagine any, I can't imagine anybody looking for a, a, a commercial recordings facility on a property would even consider that. It's really a personal sized project studio. Um, and just one other thing I remembered I wanted to mention um, that our neighbors, specifically the three homeowners represented by the attorney, have said that they don't want commercial activity on the road, yet one of the homeowners represented by the attorney, Jesse Marcus, ran a home occupation without a permit from his home with a daily employee for years up until at least April 2018, while we were living here. So we're not changing the character at all. Okay. Anything further? Cliff, Ms. Svensson has her hand raised. Do I? Okay. I also see a notation at the bottom that two people have entered the waiting room for this meeting. I don't know whether they dropped off or they are. Oh, no. Entering. They are there. They are there. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Then uh, if Ms. Svensson would care to speak. Mr. Mallory, you sort of covered my point. Um, what I wanted to uh, 
what I wanted to just point out is that the, the bulk of the letters of support that came into the board were from people who do not live on Catapa Lane. They live in other parts of town and they appear to be interested in coming in and recording in the studio. So that really has no bearing at all on the, um, the effects on Catapa Lane. And it really has no bearing on anything because they're just basically acting as character witnesses. And as uh, you pointed out, Chairman Mallory, the, the particular applicant's intentions are not, not particularly relevant because um, this, if, if a variance were issued, it would run with the land. And so an oversized music studio would be allowed on this lane forever. So just wanted to point out those additional items. Okay. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? Um, I'm going to have to open up each person to see because the people on the phone may not know how to raise their hand. Uh, so the 4621, uh, did you wish to speak? Person at the uh, phone 4621. Okay, should I move on, Cliff? Yeah, please, just um, if there's no one else who wishes to speak. Well, there's two others that have already spoken. Would you like me to check with them one more time? Ms. Fenson? Are, are you aware of anybody else who wishes to speak on your behalf? Yes. I'm, I'm not, but they may have something else to yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Mike, I'm sorry, then maybe you should canvas them. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Yeah, the yes, 5180, yes, yes. You, are, you are opened yeah. up. Am I am I opened up? This is yes, Jesse yes, Marcus. You are. Okay. So um, so the first thing I wanted to say is um, no one wants this. In fact, I'm the last person that wants conflict with neighbors and there is no bullying that was happening. And there's only three homes that are technically represented. That was just based on a letter that we had to just between the attorney and us for who's, you know, who's paying the, the lawyer, but there's over 25 local residents that are technically being represented and that don't want this. And there was no bullying about it. In fact, most of the people came to me as president and said, hey, what, what's going on here? And we all kind of looked into it together. So there's no one that's like, everybody's an adult here. Like we're not bullying, we're not, you know, trying to, you know, get people on our side. I mean, this is just what's happening and we don't really want it. So the next thing I, I would just kind of want to speak to their attorney about the construction stopping and the work trucks stopping and how inconvenient that was, but that's not the case anymore. Well, he, he doesn't actually live on Catalpa, so he doesn't realize that every day, based on the Hoots' um, complaints of the house, that they have construction vehicles every day. In fact, there was an 18-wheeler from Williams here a week or so ago. Every day, there's work trucks and a lot of friends coming and going, and in most cases, they speed. Um, I, 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 I would like to speak to the fact that Hoots indicated that that every that the people before them were summer home people for decades. Well, that that's not true, because I I purchased my house in 2005, and Stephen and Robert, who lived here from 2006, who bought the home from the DeGloria's, from 2006 to the sale of their home to the Hoots, 2016, they were full time residents. We never had any complications with them and they, they, they drove back and forth all day long. They had a dog that they used to go to the rail trail with. And so they lived here full time. That's not true that it was just summer home people. Um, the other thing is that um, the realtor on Hemlock is actually not on Hemlock. She's on Ray Cliff at the very top of Ray Cliff, which is one, two, three roads over this goes Hemlock, Wilderness, and then Raycliffe, and she's at the top of Raycliffe. So technically, like, she's not going to be affected by noise and or traffic. So that, that's not true. And um, 
So she's actually three roads over. And um, that's all I wanted to say. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, the person at 0647, do you want to add anything else? Yes, thank you. Um, I want to I wanna speak to the 25 people that Jesse just talked to who submitted comments. And Brianna, thank you for putting up with all of our emails. Um, and maybe Allison Hoots doesn't understand what it means to give people agents to speak for themselves, but every person that submitted that is speaking for themselves. It is not because of bullying and it's not because of anything else. They're speaking for themselves. People do have voices and they're speaking out right now against what's going on with the hoops. So please don't think that we went around like riling people up and like bullying people and all of this nonsense. Those are people who chose to submit their comments because their lives are being affected. The way they want to live their lives are being affected just by this one couple. And so it's just embarrassing, honestly, that they're claiming that anybody is doing anything else and that somehow we shouldn't take into consideration people's voices. Thank you. I just wanted to, um, this is David also, I just wanted to also add that the three people represented by Ms. Benson, who Allison alleges are the only vocal people, those are the three people who actually live next to the Hootes. They're the three houses that are most directly in front of their house. MJ and Steve literally stare at their music studio every day. And Jesse is like a couple feet further down and we're the next house after that. So that's why we are so interested. We are the three that are right next to them. It's not like we're some loonies. Um, and regarding bullying, when you just do whatever you want without any consideration for others and assume that you can just do that, that's what a bully is. So I would say that Allison Hoots is a bully and we are standing up for ourselves. 25 people in the community signed a letter opposing their construction and their intention to run a commercial music studio. The whole community is speaking out saying they don't want it. All their letters of support come from people who want to record in their studio. So, I mean, it seems pretty straightforward to us. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else, Mike? That is everybody. <laughs> are there any other hands raised? No? There are none. Okay. Any comments, questions from the board members? Yes, I'd like to have a question. <clears throat> Who, who are you directing at, Bill, so I can open their mic? The Hootses. Okay. And what year did you buy that place? I didn't quite catch that. Um, so we purchased the property in 2017. No, 16. 2016, and October. We moved in in 17. We then brought in a contractor to put in new pendant lights and a couple of other things and that's when we found mold everywhere bad plumbing um and we basically had to redo a lot of the house that was unanticipated our inspector was not thorough it turns out well. okay and what year when did you plan on ever wanting a music studio was this just recent or back years ago or what no I, since I've, we bought the property yeah i've been a musician for most of my life and have had home studios and one of the reasons i think i stated this before one of the reasons for moving here was so that i could elaborate on that dream a little bit more it took some time because we we had hoped to purchase a parcel on the top of the hill from our neighbors um, and they were not interested. And then we were like, well, we might as well just use the giant field that has nothing in it at the front of the property. And that's where we ended up doing it. That was the only place that made sense. Right. And so we commenced construction in 2018. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, I have a question, Cliff. So uh, this is directed to Allison and Sean. You know, um, I understand a recording studio, but 
the rest of the the business model that you're looking at is a bit unique to me. So I just, you know, found some other recording studios that seem to fit the vision that you have for your place. And I just want to read to you a little excerpt from their advertisement, and I'll call them Studio X so they're not identifiable. And if you could tell me if that's what similar to the process that you're doing. What they've said is, we found that musicians are able to get more done in less time here at Studio X than at other studios because of the on-site lodging and our focused yet relaxed atmosphere. The only distractions are an eagle's nest, fire pit, and the upstate mountain breeze. Um, and they go on. They have distinctive facilities with all the necessary tools for world-class quality located in the Catskill Mountains. Guests can stay within walking distance of Studio X so they can efficiently accomplish their music and film work while enjoying the comforts of home. Phone and Wi-Fi service are available as well as spectacular natural environment and a breathtaking view. I don't know your view. I haven't been up to, to the lane yet. But does that, is that the type of environment that you're going for, the type of business? Does that fit that model or how does well, it differ? Sure, sure. First of all, we will never be um, advertising. There will never be advertisement for this. I, we are lucky enough that we were able to afford to realize my dream of having a recording studio for my own personal purposes, um, right. that we had the financial stability to do so. Um, this, we did not build the studio with the intention of immediately making the money back or anything like that. The commercial aspect that we are pursuing has, is mainly in, with respect to my output. It is for me to do my projects. And then the additional projects would be projects with friends with whom I collaborate. That's it. I will not be taking on, I will not be renting the space to anyone. I will not be taking on, uh, strangers or local bands who just need a place to make their record. The uh, guest quarters that are attached were not constructed, designed, nor intended to be for the bands coming to stay. They were, and this is the absolute truth, a place for our family and our friends to come visit. Yeah, we designed it so there was a bathroom for both my parents and his mother should they be there at the same time because that would not be a good situation. Yeah. And the, the thing, this house that we bought that has had uh, its share of troubles, uh, we love it and, and it's home. Um, it's too small to accommodate even my mom coming to visit, to be honest with you, like the room, the way the rooms are situated. So we needed another space for folks, for friends and family to come visit because we want to and know that we will have visitors. And we have had visitors pretty regularly since we built the studio. With and we live family. in a place that our friends and family want to come visit, right. obviously, you know. Um, also, we have kids and right. 730, although right now it's eight, um, <laughs> it's bedtime and there can't be really like that much noise in the house. So, yeah. so the, it's all one building, but the intentions are completely different. I didn't, I am not intending to use that as a selling point to get somebody to convince somebody to come use the studio. There's no convincing people to come use this studio. It, the only reason people would be coming here is because they are friends of mine and they want to collaborate with me and the equipment that I have in my studio that I generally use for my own purposes. And that, I think that speaks to the, the friends of ours who are Rochester town residents mm -hmm. who uh, Mrs. Svensson is basically minimizing because they are artist collaborators with Sean, which I don't think is They fair. are each and every dear friends of mine and we actually collaborate on music outside of a recording studio and yoga studios and public settings and uh, family gatherings. So these are like, these are real people, you know, not just- uh, Residents. Yeah, you know, right, exactly. Not just somebody who's like, oh yeah, totally. I get a recording studio out of this, you know. So I think the, the end of the story is, is we don't see this as a commercial business. We say commercial because we're abiding by the definition, which is that Sean would like to make some money there. Yeah, um, I would like to sell the things that I make. Right, but we are not saying commercial because you know we foresee like booking um, big band like it's, it's or just any, not even it's not been even all big band has nothing to do with how big or small well, they that's are. True. I don't want to be unfair to our friends who are successful. Right, it's, <laughs> right. It it has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with my relationship with these people. Right. right. Well, Sean's 
it's it's going to be a very like even the space is feels intimate like it's it's sean working with friends whether it be on their work or his work well whether he'd be providing contributing right whether he's providing services for a fee because we've spent our entire life savings on a music studio or not the zoning law anticipates specifically explicitly anticipates services and clients and limited visitors and we bought in the R2 district because that was the character of this district. You can't look to just one neighborhood where certain neighbors don't want to see something that was already, well, yeah, a building um, or cars, but things that are anticipated by the zoning law. Uh, and I think we, we put, brought in case law that specifically said that you cannot look to neighbors generalized complaints and say that you know, that's not permitted because it is a leg legislation, legislative decision by the, the town that this, this district have R2, uh, have class two home occupations. And that's what we're planning. Nothing crazy, no advertising of our, you know, sexy, um, I don't know, backyards or whatever. It's not no. what we're doing. No, no advertisements. <laughs> The question really wasn't about the ads. The question was about the business model a bit more. So I right. think I understand I think it. Did we, did we, I think we addressed that though. Yeah. yeah, I think you've covered it. Thank you. Cool. Sorry. Anything more, Bruce? No, I think that's it. Thank you. I have a question. Okay. Charlie, do you have anything? Yes, I have. I'd like to know how many houses are on Kitapa Lane? Something like Two, 10, three, four. four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I think. All right. Cliff, would you like me to open Jesse's? He might have, uh, being the president yeah. of the association. He's the president. <laughs> sure. I think that the estimate of eleven is probably pretty. Yeah, good. Let me, um, actually, let me just pull up the a spreadsheet that has everybody on it. Hold on. Charlie, your question is how many houses, right? 11. Yes. 11, 11 houses. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Anything else, Charlie? No, that's it. Okay. <laughs> Anyone else have a question, comment? Anyone else wish to speak? Okay. Um, can we just ask if our attorney wants to say anything? I notice also there's a someone waiting to be admitted. Uh, that's the same person who okay. was on before the 4621. And I see that Emily Svensson has raised her hand. I think, am I unmuted? Now you are. Uh, yes, yes, you are. Ben. Yeah, okay. Um, I think everything has been said at this point and on this continuation hearing, we still haven't heard anything that there's going to be excessive traffic or excessive noise um, or any detriment to the neighborhood. Um, the neighbors haven't liked the hoots ever since the construction began and that's continuing now. They have fears about what they claim will be traffic and noise, but that's all they are and completely unfounded. And the Hoots have made it clear that there's not going to be excessive traffic. It's going to be the same amount of traffic as typical residential use. And there will be no noise and no detriment to the neighborhood. And we really haven't heard anything differently today. Um, I would ask you to take a look at the document I submitted a couple of days ago, which explains the type of evidence um, that's required to be submitted. Um, to actually demonstrate that there will be excessive traffic or will be excessive noise. And that's just not the case in, right here. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Mike, uh, Emily Svensson's raised her hand. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just obviously we can't measure the traffic and noise from something that hasn't started yet, but it's clearly predictable based on 
the, uh, the intended use, which is for outside people to come in to the lane to use the studio and the noise study as, you know, we've all been commenting on the same noise study that was provided last November. I just wanted to, um, as a final note, I think everything that needs to be said has been said, um, but if there is an additional noise study, I did uh, foil as recently as Monday and have not received any additional um, submittals, but if there is a new noise study that is before the board, we would like a chance to review that and respond to it. So whether that's, you know, by allowing uh, additional written comments comment or however you want to handle that, that would be fine. Thank you. Uh, your FOIL actually specifically asked for uh, correspondence received by the planning board. You didn't say anything about the zoning board. So. I'm sorry. I, that was a mistake that I, I, I meant to say zoning board because that's the board that were before. I guess I miss uh, typed. So my apologies. I would like to get a copy of that study and um, have an opportunity to respond to it. Thank you. Um, just to state that the report was simply a clarify, the letter was a clarifying letter of the report that was submitted. So it's really not any new evidence. It was explaining what I was really trying very hard to explain without having any technical expertise that the two sounds that we used in the music studio were extreme examples and would never be used in normal operation of any music studio and that the only reason they used those loud noises was so they could actually detect something at the property line. Um, and that was why they did, you know, like we said, the sound of um, a plane taking off. A plane taking off. Literally. Um, so his letter clearly just mm. explains the, the previous report and he stated that what he was saying, you know, where they did use the same language, extreme mm. examples, um, that there, that in normal operation of the music studio, there would be no noise heard at the property line. And uh, to note the zoning law specifically talks about in the neighborhood. So where there would be like a soft whisper at the property line, we don't know who's gonna be standing at our property line and be frustrated they can hear stuff at our property line. Um, but um, yeah, in the neighborhood, there would be nothing detectable. Thank you. Are we talking about the, the May 13th letter from Francis Manzella? Yes. Okay. And it's essentially a three paragraph um, letter, the, the last paragraph of which is, please let me know if any further clarification is required. I believe that's how he ended it, yes. Is there an attachment to that? No. Okay, Ms. Svensson, I can read that letter in, into the record if you'd like. Sure, that would be great. But I also would like a chance to to um, to go back and review it and uh, perhaps sure. have our own expert because you know we've all been using the same data, which was that there was measurable noise of 47 decibels, and the property line is you know my client's property line. So uh, you know that's the the measurement that we've been using. But sure, if you'd like to read it, that's fine. Or or if you'd like to move on, I'd be happy to just review it after the meeting. Okay. Why don't we just move on then? It's it'll be available to you. Thank you. Okay. And were you waving your hand? Okay. Ben was waving his hand before, but I don't know if he wants to speak. Do you want to speak again? Wave if you want to speak, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to unmute. Oh, okay. okay. Not appear to be unmuting. Did you mute it on your side too, Ben? Can you try and unmute? I'm trying. Uh, there you go. There we go. Yeah, I was just going to offer to read the letter since I have. Oh, okay. It. Everybody wants to read it. <laughs> but if it's in the record, um, and and certainly I, if I just want to be certain that the board has read the letter because it yes. makes it very clear there'll be no sound at the property line, and also explains the extreme. Uh, sound that was produced for the first, um, you know, the first test that was done. Okay. Uh, all right. Does anyone else wish to speak? If anybody on the phone wishes to speak, if you push star nine, that will raise your hand. Oh, I have one more. Uh, 
Four six two one. Yes. Uh, this is Steve Fornell. Uh, I would like to take exception to uh, Mr. Gailey's uh, statement that there was no evidence of uh, noise and traffic. Uh, the traffic uh, or the evidence has been uh, submitted by Allison Hoot herself. Uh, the noise, as per the data, not the, I don't know about the, the newest letter, but per the data, it showed 9 dBA uh, above ambient level. Uh, the code says detectable. 9 dBA is certainly detectable. The traffic increase, there is an increase over residential use. That That's a fact. Uh, the first go around, uh, this was months ago when the hoots came before the ZBA, it was time and time again stated that it would be for personal use only. We made it specific that this, at a later time uh, to make this into a commercial use would not not go over. Uh, the fact of the matter, there's an elephant in the room, and that is the fact that this is a prohibited use in an R2 area. It's prohibited. That's in the code. Uh, so this uh, seems very clearly to be an end run. Uh, at no time was, uh, is it, in any manner, is a home occupation meant to usurp the prohibition. That is clear in our schedule of uses. So uh, I would like to make those points very clear. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else wish to speak? Okay. Do we have a motion to close the public hearing? Uh, my Mr. attorney was like raising, Mr. Was raising his hand. Yeah, yeah just just one statement in response to the, the prior speaker. Um, a class two home occupation is listed specifically as a principal permitted use in the R2 zoning district. There is absolutely no prohibition. Okay. Does anyone else wish to speak? Mike, do you see anything? I do not. Okay. Is there a motion to close the public hearing? Before motion. you do that, are, are you closing it totally or are you leaving it open for comment for a week? Ms. Vinson had asked to have an opportunity to address that. It's totally up to the board whether they they feel that's um, appropriate. I make a motion but, we close it. Um, Bill, before you make that motion, um, does Ms. Svensson wish to uh, have the public hearing remain open for a week while she considers um, the May 21st letter of uh, Mr. Oh, I've forgotten his name. May 13th of Mr. Mar I'm Manzella. sorry. Yeah, May, yeah Mar Manzella. Terrific. Yes. Thank you. Man Manzella. So you would like it to remain open for a week? Please. Okay. Um, Chairman Mallory, I respectfully request that you narrow Ms. Fenson's ability to respond to solely that letter um, because I feel like we're just going around in circles. All right. Ms. Fenson, are you asking for anything additional? No. Okay. Then um, your opportunity to um, respond will be limited to that letter. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so I th Hang on, think Clark, now, uh, Mr. Galley is raising his hand here. Okay. Yes, yeah, so we would just like, if a letter is submitted concerning the, the May 13 letter from Anzello, we would like an opportunity to review that and if necessary, submit a response, which we could respond to within a day or two thereafter. So shall we say a week for Ms. Um, Svensson to respond? Um, a total of 10 days for you to respond to me meeting three additional days. That would be fine. Um, do we need a motion? Um, you can make that as motion as part of the close the public hearing. Um, subject let to me, let me re restate that. Keep the public hearing open for one week to allow Ms. Svensson the opportunity to respond to Mr. Manzella's letter of May 13th, 2020. 
and then a further three days for Mr. Galley to be able to put in a a response to Ms. Svensson's uh, response, and then it will be closed. Okay. Is there a motion? I'll make that. Good. Charlie no. made it. Charlie. Charlie, was that you? Yes. yes. Okay. All right. Is there a second? Second. All right. So there's a motion to um, keep the public hearing open for an additional seven days for Ms. Spenson to respond to the May 13th letter of Mr. Menzella uh, with an additional three days for Mr. Gailey to respond to Ms. Spenson's uh, response. Uh, Charlie, are you in favor or against? In favor. All right. Bill, how do you vote? Against. Okay, Bruce, how do you vote? Favor. All right, I vote in favor. So the, uh, so Charlie, you voted in favor, that's three to one. Yes. Motion carries. Okay. For those seven days. All right, so the public hearing is, is closed, but for the additional time permitted, um, is there, Anything that you wish to, anything additional that either party wishes to uh, to offer at this time with respect to the Hoots application? Um, oh, sorry, I, just, I just wanna say one really quick thing. What Sean is proposing is to be an artist in an artist studio. This is not some massive business undertaking. He just wants to make art and collaborate with his friends and occasionally receive money for his services in the space. That's it. Um, and we're really sorry that it's become this terrifying thing to neighbors. Um, you know, we've been as responsive as we can be. Thank you for your time. Anything further? Okay, the board will take this under advisement um, and at our next meeting, we will um, deliberate and determine. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, the next and last app, uh, application we have is the continued application public hearing of the, uh, the tenants represent, I mean, sorry, the other landowners represented by Ms. Svensson. Um, Ms. Svensson, is there anything that, it's a continued public hearing also? Actually, this uh, is the first public hearing, I believe, is it not? We're opening the public hearing tonight. Um, okay, it's continued application public. Okay. It's continued right, application. So, it is the start of the public hearing. Okay. All right. So, would the applicant care to speak? Yes, please. Um, again, Emily Spenson. I represent Rovika Rajkishan, David Osterweil, Jesse Marcus, Mary Jean Paco, and Stephen Tiffany um, officially. Um, and we have submitted this appeal challenging, uh, challenging the applicability of the class two home occupation use to the proposed use. We believe this is not a class two home occupation and we ask the board to make that determination. Uh, just to reorient everyone, the application um, is well, the app, in the applicant's own words, to provide his services as a contributing composer and or producer while recording others' music. So the application is to allow, to open up the studio for other bands to come in and record their music. Um, I submitted a short letter today because there's been a ton of correspondence on this and I just really wanted to refocus on the key points for everyone. Um, so our first key point is that the use that's going on right now is a home occupation without a permit. Um, there was some discussion last month about whether uh, Mr. Hoots is conducting an occupation. Um, and so I just did wanna submit to you um, a reminder of the April 1st, 2019 email from Allison Hoots to the town, which stated, Sean is a musician by occupation and does make money doing so. So if there's any question about whether this is an occupation, that's the statement. Um, the other piece of evidence we have submitted is a website for Mr. Hoots Band, uh, Hoots and Hellmouth, which includes a page where you can buy their recorded music. 
So I wanted the board to have that information. Um, there's already been plenty of description of the activity that's occurring now under the, the, um, the characterization of personal use, but clearly this is an occupation that's taking place in the studio. So leaving that aside, the proposed use is something much more. The proposed use is for other bands to come in and record their music for a fee, which is not an occupation. Um, and just to really hone in on the reasons why, the first reason is that the code defines home occupation and this use does not meet that definition. Um, it, the code requires that the use is customarily conducted in a home. A recording studio that accommodates outside bands is not customarily conducted in a home. It needs to be carried on by the inhabitants here, um, it would be it would have other people coming in to record their music, which might be their occupation, but is not Mr. Hoot's occupation. It needs to be incidental to the use as <clears throat> as a home. Um, and we submitted uh, the case of Mason versus Department of Buildings of the City of New York, which uh, examines that term incidental in an extremely similar context, which is applying a home occupation code very similar to Rochester's for someone who allowed other bands to come in and record in their, in their home um, with the, the home occupant providing technical services. And that case clearly uh, applies here. So for all of those reasons, this proposed use uh, for other bands to come in and record is not a home occupation. Um, secondly, it doesn't meet the requirements for a class two home occupation. Um, and that's for multiple reasons. Also, uh, it doesn't meet the requirement of having no detectable noise, the study detected noise. Um, it, it also has non-domestic mechanical equipment um, and equipment used in a recording studio, um, or I'm sorry, the code requires that you can only have equipment that's customarily used for domestic purposes. And the code also requires only occasional visitors, but this is the whole purpose of the, the commercial use is for people to come in regularly. So um, for all of those reasons, uh, this use does not meet the criteria for a class two home occupation. It's not even about the, the size, which is the variance issue. Um, so for all of those reasons, this is just simply not a home occupation. It's a, it's a commercial business. And we just wanted to also point out that several of the support letters that came in to the board actually underscore the intention of the studio because the musicians who wrote the letters explained how they would like to come record in the studio. And uh, the, the statements include, there are many talented musicians in our community and a studio like Sean's is of immense value to all of us. And another statement says, it has the potential to draw artists, musicians, and a rich creative community to the area. Um, the, the neighbors do not want a rich creative community drawn to their neighborhood. This is their neighborhood where they live. Um, and you know, only a home occupation is allowed, which is something that someone in the home does in their home um, as their occupation. So, Again, just in summary, what's happening right now is a home occupation. What's proposed is well beyond a home occupation. Um, thank you, Ms. Fenson. Um, on page two, uh, down towards, I guess, a little below, halfway down, um, You've mentioned, I'm sorry, page two of your, I'm having a little trouble trying to operate a second computer. Uh, damn it. Page two of your May 21st letter, today's letter. Mm -hmm. um, under the subheading customarily, uh, you said a recording studio that is available to outside bands for hire is not customarily located in the home. Um, I'm sorry, it's carried on by the inhabitants. Mr. Hoots, an inhabitant, could perform and record his own music as a home, uh, as a home occupation. Other musicians coming in to record their music would not qualify. Right. If other people are coming in, they're not inhabitants. Okay. So, Mr., in other words, if a band to which um, Mr. Hoots uh, or... They, to which he does not 
um, in which he does not perform, um, they could not be recorded. They could not record. He could not record their music. Correct. Okay. But a, a, for instance, a band that he does belong to, that he is a participant and a member of, he could record. He could play his music. Is that right? Um, he can conduct a home occupation, which is him conducting his occupation. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. So an inhabitant could perform and record his own music, even if that music is part of a band, for instance, as long as he's a member of that band and performs. Is that right? Um, the board can make that interpretation. Well, I'm asking, I mean, because you've said this, I'm just asking what you mean by it. What I mean is that what's proposed, which is for other people to come in and record their music, that's not a home occupation. I got that. Okay. So I understand what you're saying they can't do. What I'm asking you is what they can do, what he can do. Well, he can certainly perform and record his own music because okay. he's there and he's an inhabitant. If he belongs to a, a, a duo, a duet, or a trio, can he perform his own music? Well, when I say that also, though, I, I do mean that that would be a home occupation that would require a permit, which is not currently in place and is not available because it's too large. But that's a whole other question. Um, mm -hmm. So you're asking if, if there were other collaborators, if they would be allowed? Yeah. You know, honestly, I'm not going to make that determination for the board. Um, you can decide where to draw that line. Okay, I'm just, you know, I, I read what you wrote and I'm trying to understand what you're saying, that's all. I, I'm drawing a distinction between what's being proposed and what's allowed in the code. Okay. I, hey, if you wanna say that he only he himself can perform his own music, that would be great. I, I'm, I'm not saying that, I, okay. I'm just asking, I'm asking you a question. Okay. Well, I think that would be the clearest form of a home occupation would be the, the person who lives there performing and recording their own music. Okay. There might be a gray area where that could include other collaborators who are actually part of you know, the same musical group also performing and recording. Well, for instance, I think you mentioned earlier Hellmouth, which mm -hmm. presumably is, is a group of musicians, right? To which, uh, of which Mr. Hoots is a member. Right. Okay. I, I think so. <laughs> Yes. Okay, could Hellmouth record there? As a home occupation? Yeah. I, well, wouldn't I you be happy? I'm sorry? No, I'm sorry, go ahead, Ms. Fenson. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. That's okay. I, I think I've answered the question. Okay, I'm just trying to understand. For, for outside bands to come in where the, the the, the request here is for outside bands to come in and pay a fee to record in the studio with Mr. Hoots providing technical services. Right, I got that. That's not a home occupation. Okay, okay. Okay. I'm sorry, Bruce, did you have a question? Uh, not at this time. Okay. Any members of the board have questions? Bill? No. Charlie? No. Okay. Okay. Uh, anything further, Ms. Svensson? I'm, I'm good. Okay. Um, Cliff, I don't uh, know if the other two members on the phone want to say anything because they're part of the, uh, the people bringing the, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the challenge. So the, the other two, well, we haven't really opened the public hearing yet. Have we? No. But but they're the equivalent of the applicant. They're they're making the challenge through Miss Fenson. So okay. She represents them. All right. So that's the only reason I, I've opened up their mics. I don't know if they want to say anything. Okay. Uh, this is Ravika and David. Um, no, we're good. Thank you, Emily, for summarizing that. Okay. So I've muted both their mics then. Okay. All right. Anyone else wish to uh, speak before we open the public hearing? Cliff, I just I do have a question for for you actually on the on the whether the other band members how they would be treated, right? And I wonder if they could be considered non-family members 
that are employees that are on site? Uh, I haven't given that one much thought, um, Bruce. Because, um, no, because in the class two definition, it's no more than one on-site employee other than family members residing in the dwelling. Now, if you have additional band members, even if they're in partnership, they're considered employees. Oh, well, yeah, they're getting paid. Right. So I think uh, to that point, I think the code is clear that it's no more than one. Okay. But I think they can have as many as they want as long as they're not getting paid. Well, that's a, that's a good question, Bill. So I think a commercial enterprise is a commercial enterprise, whether it makes a dollar or a million dollars, right? Apple computer started in a garage somewhere. They didn't make money, you know? So I don't think the dollar value on a commercial enterprise is really the determining factor in it. You know, I think there was a clear indication that this is a private commercial studio. So commercial is the key there. Um, but it's also private. Well, these these questions, I think, might be better. Um, well, if you address to any of the um, either the applicant or anyone in opposition to the application, rather than us at this time. Okay. Um, so I think at this point, what we want to do is um, determine whether or not anyone else wishes to speak prior to opening the public hearing. Any member, any any party to this proceeding either on the app on the side of the applicant or in opposition to the application. All right. Uh, ben, ben is Ben is unmuted. Yes, but I, I think you want to open the public hearing before you hear that. So it's all in the record. Let's make a motion we open the public hearing. Do we have a second? I'll second it. All right. All right. Um, Bill, in favor? Yes. Charlie? Yes. Bruce? Yes. Yes. Okay. So it's uh, public hearing is now open. <clears throat> is there someone who wishes to speak um, in the public hearing? Am I recognized, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'd like to address the comments that were made, and I'm sure uh, Sean and Allison can elaborate. Uh, Sean's already made it very clear as to the nature of this home occupation. Uh, Ms. Fenton just blatantly, completely mischaracterizes that. Um, what she said is that outside bands will come in, pay a fee, and Sean will provide technical services. None of that is true, as you already heard. Um, it's completely contrary to all the testimony and all the letters that have been submitted um, by the Hoots. There will not be outside bans. Sean will be intimately involved in every aspect of any type of project that occurs there. Um, they're not, he's not renting the space out to anybody and he's not providing technical services. He's an artist. He's a composer, he's a musician, he's a music producer. It's not technical services. The phrase technical services, in fact, comes from the Mason case that Ms. Fenson has referred to. And in that case, the, the occupant of the, of the, it was an apartment or a loft in this case, was not a musician at all. All he did was rent out the space to outside bands that would come in this role involvement was occasionally providing what the court called technical services. He had nothing to do with the music, the creation of the music, the composition of the music, and the court in that case made a distinction between an artist and the occupant in that case who merely provided technical services. The He commented, and Sean will not have any employees at all. Um, you know, band members or collaborators who come in are not his employees. Um, he will, he doesn't have, you know, there will 
with zero employees. So he complies with that, that component of the uh, class two home occupation. And in addition, with respect to the, the questions about, um, you know, Sean collaborating with, you know, with other musicians, a class two home, home occupation allows the provision of services. So even if he's there saying, helping to produce music by his collaborators, that's the service that he's providing. It's permitted in the class two occupation. That's part of the definition of a class two home occupation. So clearly it can't be limited only to himself, alone in the studio, uh, making his own music because it specifically allows the provision of services. And, and to that limited extent, we will be doing that. Um, but we had the comments about the noise again. I don't, well, this is a separate public hearing. Um, we'd like to rely on, on comments that were made in the prior hearing as well, but you all have the noise report that was submitted before. Um, that report was intentionally done at very, very, very high volume within the studio to see whether there was any increase at the property line. And despite that extremely high volume, there was only a minimal increase at the property line. And we had the supplemental letter from the noise expert saying that when it operates at, at normal noise levels, um, there will be no sound at the property line. So I just like, if I could for a minute, if I can find it here. I lost all these papers. Ah. Yeah, in the Mason case, um, the court makes a, a distinction um between um a person who um is you know conducting this occupation as part of his artistic professional occupation as contrasted with renting a portion of the premises in the first case the artist who is doing it as part of his professional occupation is exercise is conducting an occupation if you're merely renting out space to others and provide technical services, that's not a home occupation. Sean is doing the former. This testimony has made that abundantly clear. And there's nothing in the record to the contrary. The, with respect to the, the equipment, there's a, you know, one of the criteria is the equipment that's used should be you know, similar to domestic equipment. Um, we've submitted in the, with the letters that were submitted prior, um, in particular, Allison's April 6th letter um, on page, uh, page eight, and it goes on for pages or two, how prevalent and how common um, music studios are in homes and in residential accessory buildings in both the personal and the professional context. And for for 20 years now, um, the articles demonstrate that, that it, it's customary to have music studios in residences or in an accessory dwelling uh, or accessory building um, on your residential property. So it, it's clear in the record that it is a customary use and the same sort of equipment um, that gets used in a music studio is also the same sort that just a, um, a person would use who has a music studio in his own home. So there's no, there's no difference in the nature of the, of the equipment that's used either. I believe that was all of the comments that, um, that had been made. Um, there's a case with the, um, you know, an actual case where there was a glass blowing was held to be a, uh, um, a home occupation. And the same issue arose there with respect to the equipment that was being used. And in this case, there was a, a furnace and, uh, and an annealment. And the court held there that those were similar um, to equipment that's, that's in a residence. And so even in that case, we're talking about a furnace used to blow glass. And the court held that that was a customary type of equipment. And I just, you just, um, I want to make sure I got something right for our record. 
Mr. Galley, you said that you want to incorporate the paperwork and that your testimony from the prior public hearing into this one. Yeah, I think that would be beneficial. So we'd include it in the record for both. Yeah. Just want to be sure that's clear in case this record has to go any further <laughs> from either side. Yes. Is that it, Mr. Ailey? Yep, he's on mute again. <laughs> Sorry. I thought he was concluded. There we go. I'm sorry, we didn't catch that, Mr. Gailey. I think I'm still muted. No, no you're, muted. you're on now. Okay. Yes, that's all I have to say for now. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, um, Mike, um, Emily Svensson's raised her hand. Yeah. Okay, unmuted. Uh, just quickly wanted to refer the board to the February 6th letter from Allison Hoots in um, support of the variance variance, area variance application, which refers to uh, Mr. Hoots using the studio for projects where he can be compensated as solely a producer. So that's exactly the, um, from their letter, solely a producer. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Hoots has raised her hand. Okay. That's actually Mr. Hoots. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, characterizing producer as, as something that is not artistic is a very narrowing uh, concept of the term uh, production. Just a misunderstanding. It is producing. Producing is a spectrum of services that someone might provide, but ultimately, my style of production is very collaborative and to be a part of the creative process with uh, the folks that would be making music with me. Just wanted to define producer in my context. Okay, thank you. Are there other people wishing to speak? <clears throat> Uh, the two people on phone, if you would push star nine, if you wish to speak. I'm seeing none, Cliff. Okay. Um, Ms. Fenson, this is your application. Um, Shall we leave the Hoots application? I'm sorry, I, I lost you there for a second. Shall we, um, there, there appear to be no further um, public comments. No one else wishes to speak. So uh, if we move to close the public hearing at this point, shall we do it under the same terms and conditions as we close the public hearing in the Hoots matter? Uh, I have no objection to closing the hearing. Do we have any need? Uh, Mrs. Hoots is um, raising her hand, but do we have any need to continue for written comments? Is anyone requesting that? All right, well, let's, let's hear from Ms. Hoots first. Okay. Uh, I just wanted, since this is a pretty much legal issue, um, I just wanted to bring up the fact that, you know, we believed that the class two home occupation was drafted by the zoning law in a very clear way that where there is a provision of services and clients and a limited amount of visitors, you can operate your home occupation as a class two home occupation in an R2 district. If it is found that that is not the case and um, that it's ambiguous in any way, um, case law has demonstrated that any ambiguity in the law uh, must be resolved against the party trying to enforce those laws and in favor of the homeowner. Um, you know, we believe that we have met every aspect of this criteria, um, which is why we took so long to apply so we could soundproof, so we could demonstrate that we met all of these aspects, we took a risk, 
um, which is on us. But ultimately, if the zoning law is ambiguous, we respectfully ask the zoning law to look to case law and precedent that directs that you find in favor of the homeowner. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Svensson's raised her hand. Yeah. Not to beat a dead horse, but it's not ambiguous. There's a definition for home occupation. It's in the definition section and that's what we're relying on. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any other people who wish to speak? Mr. Galley has his hand raised. There you go. Okay. Yes, I would just like to um, make a con similar comment I made at the prior public hearing in terms of the evidence submitted to the board. Uh, you have firsthand testimony from the boots, uh, you know, concerning the nature of Sean's home occupation. And on the other hand, you have absolutely nothing um, from the appellants here other than Ms. Benson's characterizations of, of, what, I'm not, of, of what she claims is, is going to happen with absolutely no knowledge whatsoever. Um, and they're really just falsehoods. And then just to follow up on what Allison said um, about the criteria in, in your class two home occupation and how we believe those are clear enough and that um, we comply with those and will comply with those criteria. If for some reason, and I am certain this will not occur, if for some reason any of those criteria are actually violated, as opposed to these speculation from the appellants, they're actually violated, then the building inspector will enforce against them and they should be enforced against. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Svensson? Sorry, just can't leave that unresponded to. My clients have no way of knowing what's going on inside someone's home after it's happening. What we're relying on is all of the documentation that the applicants provided to the board to describe their intended use. Thank you. Thank you. Anything further? Uh, Ms. Svensson, do you want an additional seven days um, in this application? No, okay. All right, so is there a motion to close the public hearing? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, because they are relying on that same noise study. Is that why you're asking that? Yes, yes. I would like to respond to the noise study under both public hearings. Thank you. Okay. All right, do we have a motion to um, close the public hearing in seven days, giving Ms. Svensson seven days uh, to respond to uh, the May 13th letter? Uh, and giving Mr. Uh, Gailey an additional three days to respond to Ms. Fenson. That sounds like the motion. Cliff, I'll second that. Okay, all right, so we have um, a motion and a second. Uh, Mr. Barringer. Yes. Okay, Mr. Fisher. Yes. All right, Mr. Saris. Yes. And I vote yes, so motion carried. Uh, the uh, public hearing will remain open for seven additional days, three days beyond that for Mr. Gailey uh, to respond. And the seven days limited only to a response to the May 13th letter. Okay. Anything further in uh, this application? Okay, then um, I think um, we will uh, continue this application until our next meeting, at which point we will deliberate and um, is, uh, let's see, is there anything further? Any further business? Just so the, the board knows, you can most definitely, if you're ready, make your determinations at the next meeting, but after close of public hearing, you do have 62 days. So if if you're still not sure and you, you need more research done, 62 days would actually be the July meeting, <laughs> so we wouldn't go over. So that would, Mary Lou, would that be 62 days from this 10 day extension? Um, You know, it's, it's not real clear, but even if it's 62 days from today, we have till ju our July meeting, it's 62 days from today, exactly. Okay. So that's when you'd make it anyway, even with the extra 
you know, if we added 10 days onto that, you don't have another meeting in time. Okay. Great. Thank you. Any further business? Minutes. Uh, minutes. All right. Have uh, as everyone has. Uh, have you reviewed, have the other members of the board reviewed the minutes of uh, April 16th? Yes. Mr. Barringer? Yes. You vote to accept? Yes. Mr. Fisher? Yes. Mr. Saris? Yes. Okay, and I abstain. So motion carries, the minutes are accepted. Any other business? Yeah, I do have something. Is there any way these paperwork and everything could be a certain deadline on to like a week maybe before we have our meeting so we have more time to review it i i agree with you bill we're getting papers in today yeah we for don't a, a meeting tonight it's it, kind of <laughs> yeah. i have to do that and then make an amendment or something some kind of law or something where it's got to be in by a certain time before the meeting itself I thought all the paperwork had to be in two weeks before the meeting. True. Is that what our our rule is? I haven't been coming to these until recently, so I don't. That's Mary. That's been the town policy for initial applications, but beyond that, it's been left to the chair. Okay. Okay. Can the parties agree that any and all submissions um, to in in respect of both? Um, matters, the Hoots application and the uh, Rashkushin um, application be um, submitted, uh, what, 14 well, days prior to well, our no, on, these, on these, they have the 10 day, the seven day, and then the three day um, limitation because we've already put that into our, our motions. Um, I think Bill's talking about in general. Oh, right, any, any, uh, any of it. Any application. I don't think he's saying to these specific, but it came out in these specific applications that we're getting things very last minute. And that's very hard Yip it in the for you folks to review. All the time. Well, while I agree that it makes things a little more difficult um, getting things in at the last minute, um, sometimes situations dictate there's no way around it, right? Yeah, I, you can put them, uh, them things that come in, put them off to the next meeting where they can be used. I don't know well, if it's you or me, but I had trouble hearing that. No, what yeah. I'm saying is you could put the ones that come in late to the next meeting or not be able to be used at all, one or the other, onto it instead of rushing through it and have to use it at this month's meeting. Well, I mean, for instance, at the last meeting, there was at least one letter that I hadn't read that had come in that day, I think. That's right. Uh, it's under, but it's understood that you know if it comes in with little notice, we may not have a, a chance to read it, and we certainly might not have a chance to digest it. So you know that's that's the risk you take when you submit something um, the day of or a short period of time prior to the hearing. I mean that's. But why can't we make it a law that they can't submit it and expect it to be used at that next meeting if it's not within a certain amount of time? Okay. Well, this is something that that I think we should debate. Um, you know, let, let's think about this, and uh, maybe at our next meeting we can discuss it um, more fully. Okay. Just a thought. You know, makes it easy. Uh, it's a good thought, Bill. Thank you. I was thinking more in the nature of a motion to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> any any further business? Is there a motion to adjourn? I'll second that. <laughs> Made the motion. Okay. <laughs> there being no further business, I move to adjourn. Bill, you second? Yes. Charlie? Yes. Bruce? Uh, yeah. Bill? Yes. <laughs> okay. Motion carries. Thank you all very much. Bill, you were wrong on your 930. Yeah. I don't <laughs> Night. Thank and you, Brianna everybody. took the under. Thank <laughs> you.